What's up guys? Today we are going to learn how to beat Magnus Carlsen. And this is from a very recent game from the FTX Crypto Cup where Magnus Carlsen was playing with White against Maxim Vachel Lagrave, France's top Grandmaster. And the set one is to get Carlsen to play some weird opening like a move F3. To maximize your chance of getting to play Magnus, make sure to smash that like button and boost that algorithm. So what's the idea of F3? Well, the NRF3 is mainly just to get the opponent out of theory to make them say, okay, you prepared your knight off for 100 moves, so I'm just going to play with the get you out of book. There was actually a game where Carlson played this line before, where he played knight f6, d4. This was against Alareza Ferrucha, one of the top candidates for world championship of the 2020s. And it went knight c6, queen f2, and, and this was kind of Carlson's argument saying that, okay, I can go for my bishop to e3, I can go for my long castles. And kind of going for an uh, attack very similar to Yugoslav attack in the dragon, but where this knight is on g1 instead of d4. In any case, I got a pretty strong attack and did actually go on to win that game. So instead, uh, MVL decided, well, let's stop this d4 move and let's play the move knight c6 and punish white for not putting the knight in the center. Carlson continued with bishop to b5, pinning the knight. MVL played the move g6, not fearing the move bishop takes c6, doubling the pawns. Because without white being able to open the position, there isn't really a good way to exploit those doubled pawns. And black's just going to get a very nice pawn mass in the center, supported by the bishop pair. So white played knight g2, red bishop g7. And after d4, cd4, knight d4. One thing to keep in mind about these positions is that MVL plays the knight off almost exclusively against 1e4. And now he's been moved on into a dragon Sicilian but okay, it is a dragon ceiling when the bishop is on b5, and it's true it would be a lot better placed on bc4 by comparison. It's a much more active diagonal. Because once again, in such structures, white, black would be very happy after rook e8, c8 to see white play move like bishop takes c6, because that just opens up the b file for the attack on the king. Black played to move rook to c8 here. I think that maybe the move a6 might have been possibly an improvement, trying to meet bishop e2 of b5. And trying to get some counterplay with the B pawn. Because once you kick that knight from C3, that queen A5 is going to put some pressure on the pawn. But maybe after knight's D5 and going for H or H5, perhaps Y can still fight for an advantage even here. Well, after rook to C8, Carlson decided to play the move of bishop to E2 anyway. I think the reason he played the bishop E2 retreat is so that if black does play knight D4, then he's not trading off all the pieces. Because one thing to keep in mind is that white does have the space advantage and therefore... Keeping the minor piece on the board is generally in his best interest. Though I do think that maybe take on c6 could have been considered. Because even though this structure is normally quite nice for black, that's dependent on him getting the rook to b8 in time. And I think that with bishop h6, h or h5, that white's attack is going to be a little bit faster than black's. And so I think this was a way for white to obtain some sort of advantage. I mean, you can take with a bishop, but then you're kind of running into the same thing like h4, bishop h6, h5, g4. Like if h5 even g4 is often an idea in these positions where you can just sack the pawn and just rip open the enemy king saying that the open line is going to more than make up for it. That's an idea that you see quite a lot in the dragon Sicilian that does seem to work out fairly well here for white. Well, instead Carlson played bishop e2. So already we can see the second part of how to beat Magnus Carlson is to bluff him and think, okay, I'm just going to play my move confidently and say, yeah, your best move is not working. I have it all figured out because even the world's best players can sometimes be prone to bluffs. Those who follow poker will be familiar with this. And if you want to successfully bluff your opponents, do make sure to hit that subscribe button for more of my Grandmaster Chess videos. Now, after Bishop E2, uh, MVL played the move of A6, just supporting the move B5. Quite a logical move, I think, to try to kick that knight around. Because when you kick that knight, you're also fighting for control of the center, as well as playing for the pawn storm on the queen side. While Carson played the move King B1, Black played uh, B5, a very consistent move here. If you want to try and slow down the king side attack, one very radical idea is to play a move like h5. Uh, not h6, of course, but pawn to h5. Trying to hold back g4, h4, h5. That would have been an interesting alternative, but MVL plays directly with b5. White played a move g4, and now after knight takes d4 and bishop d4. This one is the where if you don't play very directly, white's just going to play moves like either knight d5, and after the exchange of knights have a very strong pawn on d5 taking over the center. Or he's simply just going to charge at h pawn and just mate your king. So time is of the essence, and MVL being a knight off player was very happy to play e5. And okay, it's true, normally the knight off is on, the bishop is on e7 rather than g7. But because white <clears throat> wasted some time 
moving the bishop back and forth. He kind of can afford this move, actually. Because after bishop b3, yeah, on the one hand, the pawn on d6 is weak. But on the other hand, after b4, we see why the bishop is not ideally placed on e2, because it gets in the way of the knight. And this is where Carlsen made his next mistake. So again, we can see the third step for beating Magnus Carlsen. It's game in a position where the obvious move is actually an error. Because Carlsen will often play very natural, logical-looking moves. So finding a position where these moves are bad is going to give us the best chance of winning. So in the game, why well, I played the move knight to d5 at this point. And it turns out this natural move actually gives Black exactly what he wants. Because the move that White should play instead is actually the move queen takes d6. But this takes nerves of steel to play this. Because after bc3 and g5... Well, white is getting the piece back because if the knight moves, we do hit the bishop. But still, the position is very, very complex. And after knight takes e4, fe4, probably MBL was very nervous that there'd be some danger to his king with the idea of c takes b2. But ultimately, white's threats prove more significant. And after bishop takes c6, bishop g6, bishop takes a6, bishop takes e4. Well, in this case, a move like queen, bishop 8 queen c8 does give black some interesting compensation for the exchange because the bishop is quite strong and the white king is going to be torn open with the move c takes b2 on the next move in fact probably rather than trying to keep the exchange and having the weak king it might actually be better to play the move b3 at this point because even though that pawn looks very annoying black doesn't really have an easy way to get into b2 because our queen is covering that a3 square if they were to go queen a8 and if they do take the rook we can simply go rook takes h1 and even though the material is equal, white's pieces are a lot more active than black's. We see this bishop is kind of shut in. And the white king is actually very safe. Whereas that c3 pawn could end up being a bit of a weakness later in the game. If the queens were to come off, for example, that outside pass a pawn would be an absolute monster. I think this was a way for white to play to get an advantage. Also, the move of queen to b4 and playing the queen versus two rooks position was also interesting. And this actually is the recommendation of the engine to go for this very creative double attack. But anyway, that's something you can explore in your own time. Let's see how the game played out with the move knight to d5. And the idea of knight d5, well, I think is that Carlsen wanted to play the move queen takes d5 here. Uh, but it turns out this move actually runs into some problems. So the problem for white is that now black has the move bishop e6. And he's actually sacking the d-pawn. So that after queen a5, he gets his nice open diagonals and files to attack the black white king down. And if white tries to move like b3 trying to block the attack, then black has a very nice tactic. Can you guys find it here with black to play? So do make sure to leave the move that you would play in this position in the comments below to see how you compare with the answer. Well done if you came up with the move rook takes c2. It turns out this capture basically gives black a very promising endgame uh, in the best case. And that white shouldn't take the rook because if you take the rook you run into queen takes a2. And okay, king takes to d3, we'd go queen takes b3, king d2, and then we'd have a queen c3 checkmate. So the move king c1 is forced, but then we go queen a1, again king d2, queen c3 is a checkmate, actually a smothered mate. But after king c2, queen c3, the game is virtually over after takes king c1 and rook c8, because if again, if the king moves, we've got a mate on c3, but otherwise if they play bishop c5, we give them a check with bishop at h6. And that check is just going to be completely crushing. White doesn't have a really good way to block the attack. So, the reason white really had have to go queen a6. But then this ending after rook a2 is just more pleasant for black. Where black has more space. And the b3 pawn is a bit of a weakness. And black's got a bit of an initiative to work with down that a file as well. Well, instead Carlson realized that this was kind of going wrong and played e a d5. But now after the move e4, this was a... Really, if a creative idea by MVL, sacrificing a pawn to open up that long diagonal so that Black's attack will come first. In rapid chess, it's an extremely good practical decision. Though I will point out that the move F5 and preparing the move E4 was definitely also a good option as well, and maybe even a better move, in fact. Because if they do take on B4, the idea is that after Queen C7, you can play moves like Rook B8 and E4, and actually that open B5 is probably more valuable to Black than what the pawn was beforehand. And even a move like a5 is not so bad either, just keeping the pawn. But, okay, e4 worked out very well in the game. And we can still see the fourth principle of how to beat Carlsen is to be very confident. Don't be afraid to sacrifice material in order to take the initiative and set in big problems. So, after f takes e4, rook e8. Well, we see that y played a move bishop d4. So, I have a desperate attempt to try to deal this pressure on long diagonal. And I guess it's well known that even for the very best players in the world, that's much easier for him to attack than it is to defend. 
When I have to make difficult decisions and make tough defensive moves on every move, at some point they are going to make a mistake. At this point, I think White had to play the move of bishop to d3 here. But in that case, you're not even sacking a pawn. You can still take with bishop g4. We see that the black king is very well protected by the pawns and is being carried bishop. Whereas black is able to bring the queen to a long diagonal, bring the pawn storm down to weaken the white king. And it's clear that black is very, very in very good shape here. And also, you don't really want to play a move like bishop a6 in general as white. Because even though you're giving a, grabbing a pawn, you're giving black an open a file for the rook. Which is a lot more important, because once that queen comes to a5, that pawn is really in big trouble. Well, instead, white played bishop d4, but now after rook e4, well, you could say that MPL didn't just get the pawn back, but he kept the compensation as well. Because the g4 pawn is a target, black controls that open e file, and his pieces are a lot more active, and his king is a lot more safe here. So after h3, MPL played a5, just keeping that pawn safe and securing a very pleasant advantage. One thing you might notice is that the white pawns are mostly on the light squares, and since he has a light squared bishop, that means his light squared bishop is quite passive, whereas the black bishop is much less obstructed and has a much greater freedom of movement. White now played a move rook hf1. In retrospect, maybe he should have tried to go bishop a6 and just annoy the rook a little bit, and also clear the way. Firm move rook hg1 to try to challenge this open e file. But the game saw rook hf1 instead. And after queen e7, black has complete domination of that e-file. White played move bishop d3. Black played rook to e5, just keeping the rook on a solid square. Though you could also make a good case for rook e3, because often good chess is about attacking the opponent's weaknesses. And this would be a good way to do it, because if rook d1, we would simply be able to play rook e8, and we just keep our domination over the open file. While black played rook e5 in the game, white played move queen f2, Again, probably trading the rooks would give white better chances to defend, because the rooks are doing a very good job of attacking the weak pawns. Instead, Carlsen played queen f2, and MBL just grabbed the free pawn, rook d5. So now we see step 5 to beating Magnus Carlsen is called his bluffs. If he makes a move that looks like a mistake, then don't second guess like, oh, Carlsen saw something that I didn't. Just take the material and take the win. So the game ended as follows. It ended with rook d1, rook e5. So in general, training the pieces is quite nice when you're up a pawn, and especially rook e5. And d5 would be a favourable exchange for black, because now you only have two pawn islands as opposed to three. And you've got a nice pass pawn, you can also charge down that board in the end game. So I played rook d4, queen d4, black consolidated with rook c, c5. You can see how just robust black's position is, it's very hard for white to get through. After rook e4, black now played the move bishop to e6. I think that f6 might be a bit more to the point, because it just breaks that pin and gives your rook some freedom to move later in the game. But okay, bishop b6 is still a very good move. And after b3, well, black played a move king to g8, just getting out of the, the pin here. And really, it might be a bit more precise to kick the queen with rook d5 and only then play king g8. Because if the queen does keep the pin, it's going to be on a much more passive position by comparison. But okay, it's true that when you're a pawn up, there are often a lot of good moves, and that's true for this position as well. Why played rook fe1. And okay, it's true that MBL slightly messed up step 6 of continually playing the best moves even when you're winning to convert the advantage. But turns out even with slightly bungling step 6 that MBL was still able to win this game. The move rook e4 is a mistake. And okay, it's not a big mistake, but the reason I think it's not so good is that if you look at these white rooks, this e1 rook is a little bit superfluous at the moment because it's kind of constricted to some extent by the e4 rook that's in the way. So if you keep the tension with queen c7, it means these rooks are kind of a bit stuck. Because if you do play rook e5 again, black's just going to improve that structure like we saw. And that's going to give black an even more decisive advantage. Since of course the black king is perfectly safe here. Well, rook e4 was played and... Well, that also means that the white queen has a lot more mobility as well. So just giving white a bit more hope. And actually white could have exploited the weak back rank for black and the fact this queen does cover this square. By playing the move bishop c4... And this at first might look like a blunder, but bishop takes c4 would run into the move rook e8 checkmate. And if you play d5 instead, then after rook e5, you actually can't take that bishop because of the pin on the pawn to the rook. You know, dc4, rook takes c5. So here white would actually still be in the game. You know, after a4 and bishop d3, this is very much still a fight where white can try to survive. Uh, but instead we had the move h4. And now MVL corrected his earlier mistake with rook e5. Very nice move. Because trading off the rooks in general does make it easier for you to convert the win in the end game in principle. Of course, there are some exceptions, but it's the case here. So after g5, black played rook e4. And if white were to take with a bishop, then black would just go queen c5. And 
just by constantly threatening to trade into a winning bishop endgame, it makes it very hard for white to really keep the momentum here. You have queen f6, queen e5, and we see that white's not even close to a petrol check while the queen is on this beautiful long diagonal. Not to mention it also, these pawns on h4 are also kind of weak to attack in the endgame. Well, white played queen e4, black went queen c5, and after queen a8, king g7. The main thing here is just to make sure I don't fall into some kind of perpetual check, but MBL avoided it very convincingly, playing queen g1, you know, getting a little bit of time on the clock. You know, it's a relevant point that queen f1 is not an ending that white will hold, because after takes, takes, and d5. And when you have moves like h6 and f6, we're just going to trade off the pawns, create a pass pawn on the king side that's going to deflect the bishop and king, and then once you get that pass pawn, you just run your king to the queen side, collect the white pawns, and that will allow you to win the game. Uh, well, instead we had king b2, queen d4. And after king b1 saying a little bit of a trap that queen h4 would run into a perpetual check with queen f6 and queen d8. So hopefully you guys didn't fall for that one. So MVL played h5, which is a very good strategic move. You're fixing the weakness in place. But it also means that if white does take, well, not only is this pawn still weak, but black now also has an extra pass pawn. And just by accumulating these advantages like this, you're eventually going to have enough to cash in and win the game. Well, the game saw queen f1, and after bishop d5, black's pieces are just all very well centralized at this point. So after queen e1, black played king f8, queen g3. So the players are a little bit low on time, so moves are not perfect, but certainly were good enough to win. And after queen e1, bishop to e6. I mean, I would have actually kept the king on g7 or h7 probably, because here the queen king could be more vulnerable to checks from the side potentially, for example. Actually, queen h1 is the move that Carlson played. So then after bishop d5, queen e1, queen e5, queen f2. Here yeah, see queen to a7 can be slightly annoying. But after bishop e6, now the king is able to run back to safety. So fortunately, MVL's slight imprecision doesn't spoil anything. Because when you have such a winning position and no counterplay for white, you still have time to revert back to the winning plan, as it were, or to the winning setup. And after queen f1, let's see if you guys can find the winning plan for black. Because so far, black's been fiddling around a little bit, but his next movie basically guarantees the win. So is your technique as good as MVL's? Let's find out with black to play. So do make sure to comment below with the move that you would play as black in this position. Okay, so black played the move 45, bishop to f5. And this is the key breakthrough because this bishop is the main thing that's holding the white queen side together. But it's not just that, but also when the bishop does get traded. Now the move gf5 is very strong. The key to winning a queen endgame is basically to promote your pawn without allowing perpetual checks. You know, I've heard that some people have told me that queen endgame they find very complicated, but they're actually very simple when you think of it in terms of pass pawns and perpetual checks are the only real tasks you have here. Well, unless you play for mate, but that's a very exceptional case. So the game ended queen d1, f4. And another point we see with queen endings is that what's more important than the material is how far are your pass pawns advanced. Because even though white has managed to win the pawn back, the decisive factor after queen c3, king b1, f3, is that black's pass pawn is a lot further advanced than white's pass pawn. And obviously, if you manage to promote to a queen, that's going to be all over Red Rover. So after g6, black played queen to e1, king b2, pawn to f2, realizing that white's not in time to queen the pawn, because after g7, and if we promote to a queen, well, if white promotes, then we're going to have a checkmate on uh, on c1, among other squares. So the game ended queen g5, f6, and since the checks have peered out for, black, for white, and black is about to get a second queen, Carlson finally resigned here. So yeah, you can see now how to beat Magnus Carlsen. Step one, get him to play. And actually, MVL makes sure to do it with the black pieces, which is even more impressive. So step one, play, get him to play some rare opening. Step two, go for an attack against his king. Step three, basically, get him into a position where the natural moves don't really work very well for him. Then step four, I'm already losing count what step was which. But step four is he had to basically play very bravely and sacrifice material to go for the attack. Step five is then to basically get him on the defensive and get him to make mistakes. And then finally, step six is to use good endgame technique to convert your advantage into a win. So as always, well, I don't know when you're next going to play Magnus Carlsen, but good luck for your next games against your next strong opponents. Do make sure to like the channel, sign the video, so that I know to make more videos like this one for you guys. And also subscribe to be kept up to date with more of my Grandmaster Chess videos on YouTube. So I will see you guys in the next video and good luck against that next big fish.